Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Morning, Connor. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. How's the weather out there? It's actually, it's been really interesting. It was um, 97 degrees on Wednesday. And then the cold front you guys had moved in and it was uh, 64 yesterday. <laughs> we went to a, and it was weird because our side of the valley was a little warmer and we went to a bluegrass festival on the west side of the valley. And it was like, in the morning, it was it was pretty nice. It was a little cool and then it got colder and colder. And we looked up and like, Oh, look, it's snowing on Mount Charleston. <laughs> Welcome to the so, day. <laughs> it's very interesting. Well, you know, we're at a fairly high elevation. You know, we're at 2,000 feet, and then we're in a ring of mountains. So when it starts snowing in the mountains, it just instantly gets cold in the valley. So it was really beautiful, though. So Wow. But now it's going to heat back up. It's summer again. It was a brief freak respite. Right. Uh, hey, Marie, do you think you have the uh, bandwidth to be able to do the um, prayers for us today? I think so. Zoom works much better for me than uh, Google. Awesome. So I can present them uh, if you want. That would to be go. fabulous if you could. Okay, cool. I'm going to get Susan on and uh, then I will be back and uh, well, then we'll just let you go once I start presenting, okay? Sounds perfect. Thank you. All right. Cool, thanks. Connor, if you're talking to me, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I'll mute and unmute you. You're currently unmuted. So if you want to say hello. Hello. <laughs> Connor says I'm unmuted. Good morning, everybody. All right. So let's start first. Again, Yaki, Nup Cham Sham, Emma Gesadam Bala, Yats and Chachi, Majurne, Emma Jurne, Shesucha. Kodu kandram mang poko ke ki jesu jatruki jinji lobchi shek suso guru pema siri 
Teacher, boat destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tame, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni to you, I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni to you, I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, Fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms atoms in all aspects with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, 
subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma till samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two Bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yirams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion. Please send forth waves of your blessings. Iam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Nuritayam. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed with the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that. And the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, 
no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no I element, and so on, and up to, and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Kayata gate gate, har gate, har sam gate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world's gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you, Marie. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Farrar, and I am one of Lama Jimpa's students. And today I'm going to just do some recollections, some reminiscences of um, a study that I, along with a, a few other people in a study group, have been doing of Shantideva's Bodhicharya Vitara, the way of the Bodhisattva. So I'm not going to be going through the entire Bodhicharya Vitara. I'm mostly going to just concentrate on a couple of chapters. And these are just things that were personally meaningful to me. So, but first of all, I want to thank Lama Jimpa for giving me the opportunity uh, to study this text over this long period of, of COVID hibernation and giving me the opportunity to form a study group so that I could share this experience with other people. Um, I want to thank the community of practitioners who were part of the study group. We met twice a month since September, so it's been like eight or nine months, and I am really indebted to their commitment and to their open sharing and their really, really thoughtful analysis um, that we have all shared with each other over the last eight months. It's been very meaningful to me. Um, and finally, I think we all need to thank Shanti Deva for having written this, or um, he was sharing his thoughts, his instructions, his personal practice, 
by writing the Charya, the Bodhi Charya of Atara, um, I think it was in the eighth century, so it was like 1300 years ago. And I want to stress that this text is personal. He says at the very beginning that he's writing it in order to enable him to increase and develop his own practice. And it is personal. And I think that's why it's so beloved. So if we, when we studied this, I think we all sort of got very personally involved with it because it was for our own personal practice that we were studying it. And that made it very meaningful. Um, this text is traditionally divided into three different sections. The first three ch uh, chapters are methods for giving rise to bodhicitta in the first place. And bodhicitta um, is the wish, the aspiration to become awakened, to become enlightened in order to benefit all sentient beings. So the first three chapters are methods for giving rise to bodhicitta. The second three chapters are presenting methods for maintaining bodhicitta so it doesn't deteriorate. And the final three chapters are methods for further development of bodhicitta. So as I said, I'm just gonna share some parts that particularly spoke to me. And um, I invite each of you um, to share pieces of the Bodhicharya Vitara that means something to you. I'm not, I'm gonna mostly actually talk about chapters three and seven. So I'm not gonna be talking about many of the chapters, but I know that many of you know these other chapters. So if you have things that you wish to add, please you know, jump in and I'm gonna stop at various points. And then of course we'll have discussion at the end. So um, the commentaries that the, uh, the study group used are by Tongu Rinpoche and by Pema Chodron. Uh, by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and I also um, relied greatly on a commentary by Geshe Yeshe Tobden, um, which was new to me, but it was a really excellent commentary. There's a lot of commentaries out there, there's a lot of translations, and what I'm going to be, what I have, the translation I'm using mostly today is Stephen Batchelor's translation that is in Trangu Rinpoche's book. Um, and again, if anybody wants copies of the way of the Bodhisattva. I was looking yesterday and Stephen Batchelor's translation is online. Um, Alan Wallace's entire book of the Bodhicharya Vitara translation is online. Um, I, Alan Burson's, Alex Burson's is online. So you can get this text for free just by downloading it. Okay, so chapter one. I want to say a little bit about chapter one. Uh, and this is about the benefits of bodhicitta uh, because we need to know the benefits in order to proceed and to persist. Pema Chodron's chapter titles in her book, No Time to Lose, which is her commentary on this text, um, she had really evocative uh, titles for her chapters. And the one for chapter one is Developing a Clear Intention which I, you know, I thought that was just really excellent. So this is verse 12 from chapter one. All other virtues are like the, and when they're talking about virtues, they're talking about bodhicitta. All other virtues are like the plantain tree for after bearing fruit, they simply perish. But the perennial tree of bodhicitta unceasingly bears fruit and thereby flourishes without end. So the reason that I picked this verse is not so much for the verse itself as it is for the commentary that I found out of Geshe Yeshe Tobden. And this is gonna sound really familiar because this is something Mama Jimpa talks about a lot. You'll recognize this. So Geshe Tobden says this. In the Bodhicharya of Atara, it is said that compassion is very important at the beginning, just like the seed of a plant. It is important in the middle, where it is like the water that allows the plant to grow. And it is important in the end, where it is like the fruit the plant bears. The difference between the Mahayana practitioner and other practitioners is precisely this point of having developed bodhicitta. So how many times have we heard him say, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, right? So all of a sudden, this just kind of really came home to me. 
Um, there is a saying that many people use, um, it's all good, you know, and that is a saying that I find kind of disturbing because it's glib and it's just kind of, I don't know, just a little too new agey for me. But this, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, um, what that is says to me, what that really meant to me after reading that commentary is that all of my life, all of my practice, everything that I do, done with the right intention, with the clear intention to develop bodhicitta, everything that I do is going to be a seed. Everything that I do is going to be a nutrient. And maybe some of the things that I do is going to be a fruit. But everything is either the beginning or the middle and sometimes even the end. So it just kind of brought that saying that Lama uses sort of home to me and made it more meaningful. Um, the last few verses of chapter one is kind of a summary of the benefits of bodhicitta. And this is verses 29 and 30. It says, for those who are deprived of happiness and burdened with many sorrows, it satisfies with it satisfies that it satisfies them with all joys, dispels all suffering, and clears away confusion. Where is their comparable virtue? Where is there even such a friend? Where is their merit similar to this? So for me, it's a reminder, what else besides this clear intention to awaken is going to clear away confusion? What else is going to cut through the BS, right? Why am I doing this? What am I doing? Where's my intention? It just cuts right through everything. It's like, I mean, it's always, Bodhicitta is often um, likened to a beacon or a guiding light, right? So, um, for me, anyway, I need to have a baseline. I need to have that guiding light. I need to have some sort of ground to stand on conventionally. And what Shantideva is telling me is bodhicitta is it. So um, does anybody have anything to add about developing a clear intention or what? you might feel is the benefits of bodhicitta. You don't have to, but you know, if you do. Nada? Nada. Okay. Chapter two. Um, chapters two and three basically cover the seven limb prayer that we just did, you know, the and um, the first Chapter two covers accumulating merit through offering, paying homage, confessions, and the four remedial powers. Again, Pema Chodron really aptly has this great chapter title. She calls it Preparing the Ground. Uh, chapter three finishes off the seven limb prayer. And um, Pema Chodron's title for this chapter is Transcending Hesitation. Geshe Tobden calls it full acceptance of the awakening mind. So the sixth branch of the seven live prayer is the request for the Buddhas to stay and teach and turn the wheel of Dharma. And this is verse five. And so I join my hands and pray to the Buddhas who reside in every quarter. Kindle now the Dharma's light for those who grope, bewildered, in the dark of suffering. And this had an interesting, to me, an interesting um, effect. The line note, the Buddha who, the Buddhas who reside in every quarter, plural. So as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, isn't this, an invitation to each one of us to turn the wheel. Isn't this an invitation? I mean, we all have Buddha nature, right? So isn't this an invitation to each one of us to turn the wheel, to teach ourselves at the very least the Dharma? 
it occurred to me that that is the opportunity that Lama is giving us every time that he gives us the opportunity to do a talk. Every time that he invites questions, invites comments, isn't he giving us the opportunity to engage with the Dharma, to turn the wheel in one way or the other? Um, so what I took away from this is when I am tentative or unsure, um, you know, like, I don't want to ask this question. It sounds stupid, or it sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about, or I can't phrase it properly. So I don't ask the question, or I don't make a comment. And indeed, isn't that in a way just adding to my own confusion? What, who knows, you know, what kind of light would dawn if I said, made a question, even though to me it sounds stupid, but it clicks something with somebody else and they make a comment that all of a sudden shines a light for me or shines a light for somebody else. So we need, I need to transcend that hesitation and to fully accept the fact that I'm on this path and that I'm looking for an awakened mind. I want, I want to awaken. And you can't do that by, by just being mute all the time. Not usually my problem, as most of you know. Um, so I think that part of my acceptance of the commitment to fully awaken is that, you know, I will gladly accept when Lama asks me to do something, I will gladly and more fully open and fully engage in darshan um, and in conversation with, with my Sangha brothers and sisters and it was just anybody, right? Just more fully engage, just to be more there, transcend my hesitation and just be more, more aware, more there. Um, this chapter, chapter three also contains the um, Bodhisattva vow. This is a really big chapter, chapter three. So here's the Bodhisattva vow. This is verses 23 and 24. Just as the previous shigatas gave birth to bodhicitta, and just as they successively dwell in the bodhisattva practices, likewise, for the sake of all that lives, I give birth to bodhicitta, and likewise, shall I too successively follow these practices. So, um, transcending hesitation, you know, this is, big stuff, right? I mean, if you really think about it, trying to awaken in order to benefit all sentient beings, that's, that's, that's a big commitment. That's a big pledge to make. So there was, is a blinding flash of the obvious in a, uh, in Trungpa Rinpoche's um, commentary that really helped me think about this as a way to transcend, this helps transcend hesitation. So, and many of you probably already know this, but I'm gonna, it was new to me, so here we go. He's talking about, um, he says, the vows of individual liberation, the Pradimoshka, no, Pradimoshka vows, and those are the vows that we take when we take refuge, right? The vow not to kill, steal, lie, um, misuse sexual um, sexuality or to take intoxicants. Those are the, those are the individual liberation vows. So he says those vows are related to physical and verbal activity and are relatively easy to keep, but they are extremely difficult to restore once they have been broken. If we decide not to steal, we just keep from stealing. It's not that difficult. If we decide not to take the lives of any beings, we just keep not doing so. When these vows have been broken, they have been compared to a broken clay pot, which is very difficult to repair when broken, right? So, I mean, any gardener knows you break um, a terracotta pot and you try to put it back together again, that break is always gonna show and it's almost always gonna leak. On the other hand, the bodhisattva vows are said to be like a gold vase. Even though we might drop it and dent it, 
we can repair it easily by tapping out the dent. So even though the vows to develop bodhicitta are easy to break, they are also easy to restore because the bodhisattva vows are related to mental activity, blinding flash of the obvious, oh yeah. We can easily change our frame of mind through confession and resolving not to do it again. We may have broken our bodhisattva vows, but by changing our frame of mind, they are restored. Therefore, these vows are said to be like a gold vase, which is easy to repair. So I found that that was very helpful in wrapping my head around um, the aspiration to awaken for the benefit of all sentient beings. You know, because, you know, I mess up all the time, but it's, it can be restored. And so anyway, that, that was, I just like the way that that was phrased. Um, verses 26 and 27 are also for chapter three, and there's going to be familiar to anybody who um, is reciting succession guru yoga or anybody who's done uh, empowerments and had that uh, commitment. Today, my life has borne fruit, having well obtained this human existence. I've been born in the family of Buddha, and from now on, I am one of Buddha's children. Thus, whatever actions I do from now on must be in accord with the family. Never shall I disgrace or pollute this noble and unsullied race. So again, I feel that those verses um, further strengthen my commitment, further help me transcend hesitation because they give me a purpose. Um, and those verses to me are also really quite joyful. There's a lot of joy in this, in this text. Um, and it really clarifies for me what, at least for me, helps make me happy. And that's having a purpose, having direction, having meaning. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. And those are one of some of the causes of happiness. So that's what I got from chapter three, transcending hesitation or full acceptance of aspiration. So does anybody want to make a comment or add something along the lines of bodhicitta? There's a comment from a previous question um, from Autumn uh, that bodhicitta allows you to transform negative things into your life, into positive things, into learning further showing that it is all good, everything becomes a way to the path. And probably nobody could hear that, right? Well, it's in the comments. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, look the at the chat. comments. Yeah, in the chat. Autumn's got, a, got a, a nice comment in the chat. You probably couldn't hear Connor say that, and it's long. I can't repeat it all. But, yeah. Thank you, Autumn. Anything else? Anybody else want to say something about Bodhicitta? about developing transcending hesitation, taking on this commitment? Okay. Um, sorry, uh, it's hard to raise your hand in here. Okay. Uh, I, I'm trying to... Uh, Who's speaking? This is Autumn. Oh, hey, Autumn. I really like that, what you were saying about transcending hesitation. That's been a big one for me this year, um, just becoming more vocal. Um, you guys might have seen my interviews with Lama. Um, and for me, doing lives is not comfortable at all. I get really nervous before everyone. And, and he knows that I take a deep, we take a deep breath before I go on every time. And once I'm there, I'm okay. But I just felt this like, uh, internal moving towards speaking out. And, uh, you know, it is difficult. But when you see it as like, you know, this is something that I'm supposed to be doing, and I've made a commitment to this path, then you kind of look at it differently, and it gives you a little more strength to do so. Um, but it doesn't mean that it comes naturally, necessarily. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it does take practice, that's for sure. But when we hear from Shanti Deva, right, that he had to transcend hesitation too. 
you know, there's this great saint, so we're not alone. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so chapters four, five, and six, I'm kind of going to skip over. Chapter four is entitled Conscientiousness. Pema Children, again, has this great there's title. A, hmm? There's a comment. Oh. Um, the comment from Eric. Uh, it's an active choice to change regardless. I think he's quoting a verse, 31. Uh, it is an active choice to change regardless from whatever your circumstances you started or currently in. We have to choose to take the path and we have teach teachings to guide us. Thank you. Um, so chapter four, Pema Children calls using our intelligence which I thought was a really good chapter title because uh, it has to do with paying attention, um, paying attention, close attention to what's happening around us. Um, chapter five is fairly similar to that. It's called Guarding Mindfulness and Alertness. And chapter six, of course, is the very famous chapter on patience. We spent in the study group a long time on chapter six, but I'm actually not going to comment on it. Um, but it's wide open for anybody else who wants to comment on it towards the um, at the end. So, but what I'm going to turn to now is chapter seven, which His Holiness the Dalai Lama calls endeavor, Tranga Rinpoche calls it diligence, Pema Children calls it heroic perseverance. We usually call it effort, which I think is kind of a, I don't know, really nose to the grindstone word that I don't like very much. What I really do like is diligence, perseverance. You know, those, those speak to me more. So the section that I found in, the, this chapter has two big sections. One of it is on laziness and transcending that and tools uh, and to understand why we get bogged down. But the second section has to do with finding the support that we need to keep on going. And I thought it was really interesting that even Shanti Deva needed to have support. So this is verses 31 and 32 from chapter seven. The supports when working for the sake of living beings are aspiration, steadfastness, joy, and rest. Aspiration is developed through fear of misery and by contemplating the benefits of aspiration itself. Thus, in order to increase my enthusiasm, I should strive to abandon its opposing forces, to amass the supports of aspiration, self-confidence, joy, and rest, to practice in earnest, and to become strong in self-control. So he's already taught a lot about aspiration all the way through this text. So I'm going to move on to the support of steadfastness, which is also called self-confidence, which is also called the firmness of purpose. And I found some of this to be really instructive. This is verse 47 and 48. It had a very familiar ring. First of all, I should examine well what is to be done to see whether I can pursue it or cannot undertake it. If I, am, if I am unable, it's best to leave it. But once I have started, I must not withdraw. If I do, then this habit will continue in other lives and evil and misery will increase and other actions done at the time of its fruition will be weak and will not be accomplished. So like, this is exactly what my parents told me. You don't want to do it. You don't think you can do it. Fine. Save it till later. But if you make a commitment, if you say you're going to do this, then do it to the best of your ability and by all means, finish it. I mean, that was drilled into me in 4-H and FHA and all my school work and, you know, all that kind of stuff that I was raised with that. So it's interesting. Here's Shanti Davis talking about this in the 8th century. 
Um, Trungpa Rinpoche divided this self-confidence into two different kinds. But one of them is um, the self-confidence of not feeling inadequate. And I kind of felt that this period of time during the COVID hibernation was a time that I could use to gain more resources, a time that I could use to become more competent, um, to become better educated, to um, just become more confident because I am more competent. Does that make sense? So um, I just I just thought that you know this this um, this self confidence um, was a really important point that he brought up. Um, there is the support of joy, and again, there's a lot of emphasis on joy all the way through this text. So these, this is verse 63 through 65 in chapter seven. He says, just like those who yearn for the fruits of play, a bodhisattva is attracted to whatever tasks she may do. She never has enough. It only brings her joy. Although people work in order to be happy, it is uncertain whether or not they will find it. But how can those whose work itself is joy find happiness unless they do it? If I feel that I never have enough sensual objects, which are like honey smeared on a razor's edge, then why should I ever feel that I have enough merit, which ripens in happiness and peace? So what he was saying, or what he's saying to me anyway, is that practice, study, meditation, the company and the conversation of good friends, devotion to the Dharma, devotion to my teacher, that's what produces joy. That's what produces happiness and peace. And how is it that I can ever have enough of that? That's what you can do to get joy you can't have enough. You can't do enough. Any comment on that? Nada? No hands raised. All right, you guys. Okay, the fourth support is rest. And this has got an interesting twist, actually, to it. This is verse 67. When my strength declines, I should leave whatever I am doing in order to be able to continue with it later. Having done something well, I should put it aside with the wish to accomplish what will follow. So he's basically saying, don't rest on your laurels. Okay, so you studied, I've studied something and I understand it to whatever ability, whatever level I can understand it at this point then move on. You know, there's more to learn. There's more to do. Um, don't rest right where you are. When you're tired, rest. But when you finish something to the best of your ability, then it's time to take the next step. You can always go back because we always are able to understand things differently and more thoroughly and more completely as time goes on. But don't don't just don't rest. Don't don't rest on your laurels, basically. Um, and finally, chapter seven. Well, chapter this chapter it begins with uh, a, a metaphor and it ends with the same metaphor. And again, we're talking again about perseverance, diligence, effort, endeavor. And so the metaphor is basically not too tight and not too loose. So what he says in the very first verse, this is part of the verse, just as there is no movement without wind, so merit does not occur without enthusiasm. And then the final verse says, just as the wind blowing back and forth 
controls the movement of a piece of cotton, so shall I be controlled by joy and in this way accomplish everything. So this vision to me at the beginning, at the end of this chapter of, you know, it's a vision that's very common in my childhood. I don't know about yours, but of sheets drying in the breeze on the outside clothesline. Um, and just the other day, I was watching a kite sort of, you know, rising and floating around in, in the breeze. And I found that metaphor, just that visual even, to be really helpful in understanding the extent of exertion, the extent of diligence and, and effort. Um, not too tight and not too loose. I mean, we know when we're, we're flying a kite, right? Really, not too tight and not too loose. The thing will dip and drop entirely if we do either too tight or too loose. So that is all I have to say because I thought y'all would have a lot more to say. So now I'm gonna open it up and um, comments, other pieces of Shantideva that are important to you or anything you wanna know about Shantideva that I or the members of the, the support group of the uh, study group are gonna be able to, to converse about. Matthew Cruz. Yeah, Matthew, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Hi, really enjoy Hi. the talk. I I am confused. I, I looked it up, the, the difference between intention and aspiration. And the definitions are pretty similar too. So I wonder what your thoughts on the difference between those two are. You know, there was, I had a piece in here on aspiration and I dropped it. Um, do you remember the verses? Let me see if I can find them. Um, they are in the precept dedication prayer that have to do with, oh, I'm not going to be able to find it and I'm annoyed at myself. Um, those verses that are, may I be a bridge of, uh, uh, for mem shoot, 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 shoot. I wonder if there's any way I can remember that. Ah, goody, I marked it. Here it is. Okay. So here's aspiration. And you all are going to recognize this. This is, it happens to be from, I think, the first chapter. No, it's from chapter three. Verse 18 starts. May I be a protector for those without one, a guide for all travelers on the way. May I be a bridge, a boat, and a ship for all who wish to cross the water. May I be an island for those who seek one and a lamp for those desiring light. May I be a bed for all who wish to rest and a slave for all who want a slave. May I be a wishing jewel, a magic vase, powerful mantras, and great medicine. May I become a wish-fulfilling tree and a cow of plenty for the world. Just like space and the great elements such as earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. And until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of buried beings to reach, that reach unto the ends of space. So that's, you know, very famous passage. That's aspiration. And the commentaries, there was one commentary in particular um, that said, you know, that is so vast. I mean, how can I ever, ever attain to something like that? Well, the idea is to think bigger. The idea is to see the boundless. The idea is to um, have vast view and intention. So that, that, that to me is aspiration. 
that's that's the thinking really, really bigger. Intention to me is a little more narrow and a little more specific. Like I intend to benefit this person by doing something, you know, like, like, but to me, intention is specific. Aspiration is big, is, is very vast. And you fulfill aspiration one intention at a time. Right. I don't know. That's, 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 that's what I'm coming up with. What do you think? Yeah. I think what's coming to me is like aspirations, like the North star and intentions, the rudder on the ship. Yeah. Good. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. I, I yeah, appreciate that's, that, that's a good, that's a good metaphor or simile. I don't know which is which, but yeah, great. Thank you. Thank Anybody you. else? about aspiration or intention or anything else having to do with Shanti Deva. Marie has a comment on that. Huh? Marie? Yeah, Marie. Marie, do you want to unmute? Marie, you have to unmute. Yeah, I'll unmute. Um, I was just thinking that, like, just thinking about what you just said, that intention is, in my mind, is kind of action oriented and aspiration is visionary. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Anybody else? What about the people from the study group? Can anybody give me an indication? Aha, uh -huh, I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what, what was it like to do this study and to what degree, you know, did it have any kind of effect during COVID, during everything, during whatever? Does anybody want to comment? Karen, you were there some. Kathy, you were there a lot. Um, for me, this is Kathy speaking. It was, and I still use it in my daily practice. I often, in fact, today, I went, I knew you were going to talk about this, but this ha didn't have anything to do with that, but I'm having a particular <laughs> struggle. I know I, I, I'm having a particular struggle with something and I'm now using that as a resource um, to go back and to kind of look at, can I find what I am struggling with in parts of what he wrote? And sometimes mm -hmm. I do Sometimes I don't, and then sometimes I run into it on accident. But for me, it's sort of been the practice um, book or the workbook, or, you know, I figure that so much of what he struggled with, I struggle with. And so I, I look at it almost every day. Um, I don't have all the commentaries like you do, and I certainly don't have them. Uh, I, I can't, um, I have two commentaries, but I can't go back and, and recite them. But I, I think this is something that I'm going to use a lot. So yeah, it was, it was profound in that way to me. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I wasn't there to able to be there all of the time, um, just for various reasons, but, um, this is the, I think the third time that I've, uh, done a, like a long study on this text. I've done it with Geshla and with you. And I find that every time it isn't just that my understanding deepens, things have become broader and more open and I find new things or new perspectives on other things. And it's a book that I would urge people to not just read once and say, okay, I read that important text. Uh, we're all on a journey. And I really think that this book is just such a perfect guidebook to that journey that can be revisited over and over again as you're um, as you train and your understanding deepens. Um, it's definitely worth uh, 
attending these classes over and over again, uh, especially with different teachers. That's a really neat thing as well, you know, doing it with you, doing it with Geshe-la. So, Thank you. You know, um, that's true. This is, I think, my fourth time through. Um, and, and I kept going, oh my God, have I read this before? Like, you know, I know this is at least my third time through. And I think fourth, and I'm just going, whoa, I, I never saw that before. It was amazing, really amazing. Um, and, and I don't think I've really studied it quite as, as in depth as I did this time. But indeed, yeah, yeah, it's not one of those ones. And I don't know if I made it clear, I probably did not. This, this goes through each one of the paramitas, right? This, there is a chapter on each of the paramitas with the exception of generosity, and generosity is spread throughout the entire text. So um, this this is a, a, a text on Lam Rim um, and then on the, the paramitas. So Karen, you got something to say? You always, I'm expecting you to say something. Um, I guess I'm, you know, I don't think I was able to attend enough um, and join you enough, uh, you know, to, to really have a good grasp on on the whole text. Um, yeah, I've studied, I did try to study chapter nine with Venerable Steve. It was very, very hard um, because he is such a scholar and translator um, that it became very, very technical. And so there's a, there's a lot in chapter nine that and, and it was very hard. And I finally just said, I can't get this at all. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's, I can see that this is a text I'm going to go back to. You know, I think that the chapter that I remember the most um, just in in my daily life is is the one on patience. And and it's probably one of the more famous parts of his, you know, text, although the whole thing's pretty famous. Um, and just trying to to really treat other people in a way differently than my automatic reactions and i'm still even now i'm i'm having these i'll have these automatic things come up and and they are coming out my mouth and as i'm seeing them coming out my mouth i'm going what am i doing i'm like how am i saying those words why is it coming out like that and it's and i find it's partly because i'm frustrated because i can't find the right words so then I just say something really awful that comes, you know, it's like comes all out. And, and I, I just realized how much work that I have to do still, you know, to really, um, you know, really put into practice um, these teachings. And I see the value. And when you read that, that passage, you know, on that, on that aspiration, it's just so beautiful. And I so, it's just so joyous to me to even hear it. And, and so I know that this is really a really important uh, book and way to follow the path, you know. So I, I want to go, I'm looking forward to going back over and over. And I, I took a course with Pema Chodron and she was going over the Paramitas and it was the, just the depth of that was just incredible. It's just, there's just so much to it. And, you know, of course I've probably forgotten like have it by now, but but it's, you know, I just want to keep going back over and over. And I think that's what the message for me is to keep going back over and over and, you know, not beat myself up about it, but just keep looking at it. And eventually, you know, it'll, it'll get better and I'll be more, you know, skillful. So thank you very much um, for doing the class over this whole period of time and for giving the talk today. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Okay, other comments? Well, this is Doug. Hey, Doug. I just wanted to comment something what Karen said. You probably heard this before about uh, it's a great accomplishment to catch yourself while you're saying something. <laughs> the first step is to not even realize you said something that's not very dharmic. And then the next step is to remember to catch yourself a day later <laughs> and then maybe an hour later but to do it while you're doing that's you're getting there you know <laughs> yeah what is it that lama says something about the true miracle is 
changing a negative thought to a positive one, right? That's yeah. the true miracle. I yeah. think I've heard him say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Other comments? Okay. That's all I've got to say. Oh, I just want to, um, this is the first time that I've actually done any thing in the temple other than since God, what? March of April, May, June. So 14 months. Yeah, in the last 14 months. I've been in here a couple of times just to drop stuff off or something. But this is the first time that I've been in here to actually do something having to do with Dharma. And just doing the prayers, the opening prayers, I got to tell you that when we reopen, y'all, it's really like, don't stay online, come into Sacramento, you know, be vaccinated, be safe and all of that stuff, wear your masks and all of that, but come, oh my goodness, it's just really makes a difference to be here really makes a difference i'm just amazed i just i didn't know that i would feel like this and i do okay closing prayers marie you're up thank you thank you susan so much that was wonderful oh. here we go you mute me Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful chinresic Tenzin Gyatso, Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjishri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, everybody. It was so nice to see everyone. Miss you all. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, nice to see you, Marie. Yeah. Thank you all. See you Thank soon. you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Okay. <laughs>